Jump, presented by Dell. I am Rachel Nichols in my nice heavy sweater with Brian Windhorst, <laughs> Robert Ori. The Clippers went into Dallas and took two games to tie the series two to two. They dominated in game four, especially winning by 25 points. So, Robert, I got to say, I'm going to do a little mea culpa here. When Ty Lu, after game two, said, oh, yeah, sure, they came and shot the lights out on our floor, but let's go see them try to do it at home. I was Don't like, mea culpa that. That was an insane take. I was like, that is an odd thing to say. I didn't even, I didn't kill him for it, but I was just like, that is not, let's see if they can shoot well at home. It's not something we hear normally in the I, NBA. And then he was right. That's when we'd be like, huh? It was a head he scratcher. Was, he, I scratched my head again. I didn't kill him for it, but I was just like, well, that is not what we usually hear. And he, I will give him credit. He was right. The Mavericks shooting numbers did drop. Had the Clippers figured out something with Dallas going a little smaller, all the stuff they did. I think when you watch these games, the last two games, the Clippers were in attack mode. They was like, okay, you know, you've been attacking us on our home court. Now you're going to get home and be comfortable. So we're going to go in attack mode because if you look at this Dallas team, there's nobody real on this team. You say, oh, he's a great defender. Oh, he's a decent defender. They don't have that. And you think about Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, two of the most dynamic offensive players in the game. Attack these guys. Go at them. And when now... That's what they're doing. I've never seen Kawhi shoot so many shots with two seconds within the shot clock. He just comes down and raises up. That lets you know he's in attack mode, and he is killing them right now. Yep. What do you say about this team? They are like <laughs> they are like a child who was bringing home C's, and then they get a hundred on the test, and you're very happy with them that they got the hundred. You're very impressed, but then you're like, but how did you get the C's? Why why are we getting the C's? You're you're better than this. And here's, we're going to switch into a little betting segment here. Whatever you do, do not bet on the Clippers at all. I have no idea what's going to happen. This is a team that knew that they were in trouble down 2-0. Mm -hmm. Knew that the Dallas Mavericks were the best team in the NBA, one of the best teams of all time, when they lead after the first quarter. Yep. They're like unbeatable when they lead after the first quarter. So they, they know we're in and big yet trouble. And they fell down in game three. <laughs> what am I supposed to read out of that? No, you are, Rachel, you are right. Ty Lue made defensive changes. He simplified their defense. He went smaller. He basically said, Chris has Porzingis. I know you're seven foot, but we're going to guard you like a guard. Yep. And it worked. Their defense did improve. And went at him defensively, obviously. For, yes, they shot five of 30. Um, on three-pointers in game four. We can't ignore, though, that Luca had a serious neck problem. It's, it's, it's helpful to be able to look left. Yes, when, when you are guard. a point guard. And someone who really relies on peripheral shooting, where he doubled over just there, I remember that. I mean, he he fired one of those great passes, and then literally you could just see in his face that it put him in such pain. Now, I don't know. Again, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know how close this is to Chris Paul's injury. We saw a few days it took to yeah. really get to a point where he was comfortable playing on the court. I don't know if the Mavericks have that kind of time with Luka or how much better he's going to feel. He has said it's been improving, but you can look. I mean, those numbers tell you everything you need to know about his health right now. And Robert, if he's not close to 100%, <laughs> I mean, you talk about what this Mavs team does yeah. and doesn't have. If they don't have a good Luka Doncic, that's kind of... When you have a guy like Luka who is so important to your whole team, and if he's not healthy, your team is not healthy. So if he's not on the court making everybody around him better, the Dallas Mavericks are going to be in trouble because there's no Jason Kidd walking through that door. <laughs> and so they need someone to make other guys around the team better because I have seen the lives off him. the last game and a half, and my expectation is that that is the way they will play going forward. You have the ability. You have the game plan. Do it. Do it. Here is my, here, here's what I will say. <laughs> I give a lot of credit to Kawhi and Paul George for this. Yes. Last year when the pedal was to the metal, the coach before the game told me he was going to sit me. I told him, hell no. Nah. All looking, all driving, falling away. It's good. He looks like the old Chris Paul. Davis, he's grabbing his right leg. One of the best players in the world, and you have to adjust. His shoulders were built for a reason. It takes for me to put some more on top of it. And so be it. To have him out there sort of guarding you, knowing you somewhat less than, it was good. Good for him to just be out there and compete. Welcome back to The Jump presented by Dell. We've got Robert Ori, Brian Windhorst still here in the studio. I'm still excited, not over it. All right, let's talk about the massive Game 5 tonight in Phoenix. Anthony Davis, questionable for Game 5 tonight. MRI confirming that he did, in fact, strain his groin in the Lakers' Game 4 loss. Now, LeBron played 38 minutes in that Game 4. He recorded 25 points, 12 rebounds, 6 assists. But, Brian, with AD injured and possibly out, how much pressure would you say is on LeBron James today? It's a funny word, pressure, because it's not like how he plays in this game is going to define anything in his career, but it's going to define this season. 
And if you go back and look at his career, some of his most pivotal games have been Game 5s in 2-2 series. His greatest game of his early part of his career in Detroit. Mm -hmm. I know you were there. I game was there. 5, double overtime. <laughs> his, his, the game that pretty much ended his first Cavs career, Game 5, 2-2 against the Celtics. He had several other big Game 5s when he was with the Heat in close series. Game 5 in a 2-2 series is obviously a vital game. This is where, when you have a guy like LeBron James, it makes all the difference in the world. The, the thing is, there, because AD is out, he's going to really, as great as he can play tonight, he's got to have help from his teammates, and they've got to play top-level defense because the Suns have been, been getting their legs underneath them, and they're going to be playing at home, and that crowd's going to be into it, and this is going to be a tough one. Yeah, the crowd is crazy in Phoenix. It is. And it's a young team. And think about this. You are trying to make your name in this NBA. I beat the Lakers. I beat LeBron, LeBron. James. Not the Lakers. They're going to say, oh, we beat LeBron. And they're coming at them. So LeBron is going to have to muster up some type of energy from somewhere because we know he's been in this league a long time. The most playoff games ever played by an individual. But it ain't just about LeBron. It's about Dennis. It's about KCP. It's about that whole team. And they got to find someone else to stay up. Think about this. Dennis Schroeder, you learn from CP3. So you know what his mental is. You should go out and try to attack and tell your teammates what you need to do to try to defeat him or try to break him down. But Kyle Kuzma, you really got to step up. This is the one guy the Lakers need. We always talk about a third score. Yep. Now you became a fourth score because of Dennis Schroeder. Now you're the third score again. You've so, got to step up. So they are shooting their team, shooting 34% on open three-pointers, four to six feet of space. During the regular season, they shot 40% when they were not one of the good three-point shooting teams. They need at least an average game of open shots tonight, and ideally an overachieving game. Right, but if they get, basketball is harder. Those numbers do. I know, but that was go down the difference it. between them in the bubble last year is that they hit those outside shots, and with that buffer, they became a dominating team. They're going to need that outside shooting. So you mentioned some of those pivotal game fives. They all not have been in the first round, but we have seen LeBron in those games where it was just like, you remember that game in Boston, that second year he was with the Heat, right? And it was like, you have to go win this game. He needs to put it on his shoulders and do it. And in the first round, he has never lost back-to-back -back games, ever. 71 games that he's played in first round, never had a back-to-back -back loss. Tim Duncan and, oh, look, Robert Ori on that list also. <laughs> Top three of all time, Robert. And, and, and just this goes back to, is he still a guy at this point in his career? And frankly, with this injury, I don't even think I would be asking this question before he sprained his ankle. But as Frank Vogel has said multiple times, he said he, he has made the point. LeBron is not completely right yet. LeBron has said he's not 100 percent. Is he capable at this age with this injury he's still nursing, going out and putting the whole thing and just going out and getting the win? I, I really think he can, because a lot of times as a player, when you have someone like A.D., you can say, I don't need to do the things that I normally do because I have A.D. Now A.D. is out. I got to ramp it up a little bit. I got to go out there and attack the basket, because if you watch LeBron play in the games, he's only spent twice. You know, he comes down the lane, he spins. He's only done that twice. Really? And that lets you know that that ankle is not right. Now he's going to do that because that's how he gets to the hole. That's how he get and ones and buckets. He has to be in attack mode in order for this team to be successful. He can't just sit on the perimeter and play at the ball because he has two good defenders on him. Bridges, he's one of these young, tough yeah. defenders we talk about trying to make his Great. name in his league. So he has to be in attack mode because vets like that get calls. Well, look, just as the Lakers get more injuries on their plate, the Suns do seem to be getting healthier. You heard that little clip of sound at the front of the segment here. Chris Paul definitely looked better. Better range of motion all the way through in game four. Still has not made a three since game one, but he led the Suns 18 points, nine assists, and just immeasurable confidence he gave that team on the floor. 32 minutes. Look, Rob, how much better did CP3 look to you? And what do you expect when he's had another two days of rest for tonight's game? 100% well, better. 100% better. You can just tell by his shot. He had a hitch in that shot when he first hurt his arm. And when he was going to the free throw line, he was shaking like, oh, I have no feeling in his arm. So there's a lot of things going on with him but you need him on that court not just for his shot making ability his playmaking ability but his leadership mm -hmm. he's always in the ear of the guys and telling them what to do because the guy is one of the best vets to ever be in this game a great great teammate and he wants to get to that championship he's been so close so many times now he has a team that can do it so the Suns played in the Western Conference Finals in 2010 mm -hmm. Mario Stoudemire's last year there I would argue this is their biggest game since then biggest game in a decade mm -hmm. they traded for Chris Paul they drafted Devin Booker, 
They drafted DeAndre Ayton, signed these guys to contracts for this moment to win <laughs> this game. Now, obviously, it's not the BL end all. We're talking about a first round game. We're talking about a team that hasn't been in the playoffs in a decade. This is where the Suns say we either are a real contender or we're not. Mm -hmm. We're going to be on our home court with our team if, if, if generally full, full power, and we're going to beat this team. We're going to beat LeBron James. Huge <laughs> moment for Phoenix. Chris See? is aware of it. Absolutely massive game in Phoenix tonight, and I want to see high-level basketball from the Suns. It's going to tell me a lot about them, way more about the Suns to me than the Lakers. Well, See, even he said it, beat LeBron James. Not yep. the Lakers, Great. beat LeBron That's James. Right. <laughs> That's true. That's the way it is. Yeah. It was interesting. So in game four, I was the sideline reporter on our ABC broadcast, and you get really into the weeds right on the TikTok of you know Chris's injury and all of this stuff. So Monty tells me not long before the game, he's going to really have to prove to me in pregame warm-ups that he is... That, that basically, I mean, yeah, because he was yanking them out of the game, right. which is no good. He said, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he said the equivalent of he's going to basically have to show me that I'm not better off giving those minutes to our other guards. And he goes, you also need to hear from the medical staff that giving him a day or two of extra rest by pulling him from game four isn't the best thing either. And he, he seemed that he was going to hold Chris to a very high standard for Chris to get out, out on the court. And you heard Chris then post game saying Monty was like, eh, I think we're going to sit you. And then Chris was like, you've got to let me get out there and show what I can do. Yes. And that to me is just the heart of who Chris Paul is. He is so competitive and he is the kind of guy who shows up for his team. And we got to see that again.